Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back to the Fading Memories podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Fink. Today, we are talking about baby doll therapy with Tanya Moon. She is the founder of the Grand Baby Project, and I know you're going to find some of this information really surprising because I did when we had our little pre-recording chat. So thanks for joining me, Tanya. Sure, sure. So Thank tell you us, ab- oh, you're welcome. So tell us a little bit about you and then we can talk about the Grand, Grand Baby Project and baby doll therapy in particular. Yeah, so I am a native Houstonian. I live in Houston, Texas. Uh, Our project has really exploded all over the country, but I'm based out of Houston. Um, I came out of college wanting to be a police officer for the main reason I wanted to drive around in the car all day. I thought that would be like the coolest thing. Um, And anyway, I did not go that route, clearly. Um, But I spent many, many years in corporate sales, which I just loved. And my grandmother got ill and I was very, very close to my grandmother and she really helped raise me. She was extremely influential in my life. And ultimately her illness led to dementia, which uh, is kind of where all of this starts. I am not a nurse. I am not a doctor. Um, I am after her death 16 years ago, I actually then got into the medical field and spent nearly 15 years or so, uh, give or take, in hospice. And so as a liaison and coordinator, and then eventually, you know, kind of climb that corporate ladder that everybody thinks is so great that's so not. And um, decided whenever I really launched the Grand Baby Project um, recently that it was something that was going to take on the majority of my time. And so it um, it has just expanded and exploded and we are blessing people left and right. And so it's it's just been an amazing journey so far. Terrific. So what what form of dementia did your grandmother end up with? Do we know they didn't they no. didn't label them as much back no. then? <laughs> Mm-mm, no, as a matter of fact, you know, I tell people whenever I do training, we didn't have memory care back then as we know memory care today. You know, we have these beautiful, gorgeous memory care communities or even some amazing personal care homes and things like that. But um, we didn't have any of that back then. Uh, so back then, the senile or very forgetful elderly people really went into skilled nursing on the long-term care hallway and that's where they lived out their life and there certainly were no activities um no one even really talked about dementia i didn't hear that term until i had been in hospice for many many years and then i was like you know what that's what was wrong with her you she had that but um i was told by doctors i was told by nurses that you know she was just quote losing her mind and that this was all just a normal part of aging for a lot of people, which today we know is not the case. But um, back then, um, we know it it was not it was not talked about. Our situation was very complicated because, you know, that was so long ago, regulations in communities and facilities, especially skilled nursing, um, were very, very different and very lax. And so um, the ability to give, you know, pharmalo- pharmacologic medicine was um, kind of the new thing. And so that's kind of what kept everybody in check. Well, my grandmother couldn't take medicines like Haldol or Seroquel or even Benadryl for that matter, because she never even took a Tylenol. So her body could not metabolize those medications. So she kept everyone on their toes. <laughs> because they were determined to give her medicine and uh, i would warn them please don't it's just going to make things worse and it would and so um, i know now looking back um, with the education that i have now that i was probably back then seen as you know that quirky weird granddaughter that comes by that doesn't want her you know grandmother to have any type of medication when you know i i literally would just pray i 
I just, she just needs to sleep. She'd be up for three or four days straight. And um, I was like, can't we give her something to make her just rest? And she just couldn't. So it was, it was a very different time not so long ago when you really kind of put it in perspective. So if I'm doing the math correctly, which is debatable, <laughs> yeah, well, she passed away in 2008-ish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. math. I could do math today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, mark yeah. this episode, guys. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that isn't that long ago. I mean, oh, wow, 2008. You'd think they would have won. You would have thought the medical profession would have understood that losing your mind is not necessarily a normal part of aging. No wonder we're still battling that issue. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of older people that are in my circle and, oh my God, uh, I have to always inform them that it's not all timers or uh, yeah. the old people. Timer. Are, yeah. yeah. The some timers disease. They, yeah. they now know that this is my area of expertise. So instead of making a silly off the cuff comment like that, they'll ask me like, what are the warning signs of, of dementia is dementia different than alzheimer's like i can't even go to the dog park without having these conversations <laughs> yeah you know so my background was hospice and so i get hit with obviously the dementia alzheimer's conversation and end of life hospice and palliative care and what is that and everything and i'm like oh my gosh you know go into the grocery store i just give up i'm like it's too stressful just have your groceries delivered. That's what I do. It's just stressful. <laughs> I just can't escape it. But anyway. It's, yeah, it's frustrating. It's like, I'd like to be known as something in addition to that yeah, person. Exactly, which, exactly. At the dog park I am because I've got a super overly social golden retriever. And she's a good conversation starter that's not usually yeah. around yeah. <laughs> dementia or some sort of something along those lines. So how did you stumble upon how did the grandbaby project how what was the um the muse the uh, the creative spark i can do math today but i can't think yeah, apparently it's, it's fine it was it was literally a creative spark um it was absolutely out of pure desperation frankly um my grandmother was extremely combative and so you know what happens when people are combative they gotta go they gotta move and um one sunday a cousin of mine brought my grandmother a baby doll so nothing like our dolls that our therapy dolls which i'll talk about but um there we chose them for very specific reasons but literally when i say baby doll imagine the little six dollar plastic doll off the Walmart shelf, you know, that's kind of, that's what she brought her. And I thought, what is this? This is ridiculous. And I said, what are you going to do with that thing? And she said, well, I'm going to give it to her. And I said, why, why would you give her a doll? And she said, I don't know. At the time, my daughter was, was young, very young. And I took her quite often to visit nanny at the nursing home and so she was always very calm cool and collected when the baby was around my my human baby um she was always calm and and the the staff were i mean you know come in the morning come at night come as much as you can because <laughs> you'll only be nice when you have your baby and so i said do you think she's gonna think that's real and and she said i don't know i just know that she's always calm when you have cameron which is my daughter and so i'm thinking maybe it'll just distract her and i said okay i mean i thought it was the nuttiest idea i've ever heard <laughs> and uh like we wrapped it we didn't even have a blanket for it we put it in a towel and we handed <laughs> it to her and i thought she's either gonna hit us with it or i didn't know what to expect and it really just in that moment it changed everything she thought that we had handed her a newborn baby and her purpose became to care for that baby and um every day she she slept with her baby so she it was one of those really hard hard plastic dolls so she always looked like she'd been literally in a cat fight because <laughs> We always had skin tears and scratches and everything, but it didn't bother her. And um, the nurses were like, look, none of us are like woman enough to take that doll from her because she would fight. She would fight you and um, was very strong. And I said, well, I'm not going to take it from her. And so, you know, by the time we got around 
by the time she got the baby, she really was pretty unaware of who we were. She just knew that I was someone who came on a regular basis who had a baby. And she knew that she couldn't yell or scream or hit me or whatever with the baby in my arms. And she always wanted to hold my baby and I always let her, I wasn't afraid. And she was very gentle with my baby. So um, that is how she became with her doll. And she had her doll for um, almost three years. She slept with her doll every day. Um, the, we were doing dementia doll therapy and didn't know it. Myself and the caregivers in that, in that skilled nursing community. Uh, because everything was, Miss Ruby, it's time to go to the dining room. Everybody can't wait to see what the baby's wearing. Okay. Or Miss Ruby, it's shower time and we're going to make it really fast so that you can get back to the baby. Then we're going to clean the baby. Okay. Cause we know that dementia, you know, how, how they love showers. Yeah. Really. <laughs> but, um, so it really became a tool for us to bridge the memory gap with her in the, in the final years of her life. So, I always carried a package of newborn diapers with me in the car. And so I would go in and we would change her baby doll's diapers. And that is what we would do together. So then, you know, she started seeing me as someone who brought things for her own baby. And then ultimately, you know, they were like, you don't have to come every day. And I was like, what? I, I, what am I going to do if I don't come every day? <laughs> and um, it got to the point of where she was just really all about her baby. And it gave her purpose. She stopped isolating. Um, very, very few outbursts after that. She was just into her baby doll and changing her clothes and cleaning her and making sure the doll was clean, which she did with baby wipes. We always made sure we had baby wipes. Um, you know, the baby went everywhere in her wheelchair with her. And so it became, you know, something that calmed her anxiety that she was less fearful of things she was easier to communicate with from the perspective of she would try to engage you verbally although you didn't understand what she was saying she didn't understand what she was saying but she thought she was having a complete conversation with you pointing out stuff about her baby and um you know a lot of the family thought that you know we were nuts i was nuts and I was just grateful she wasn't hitting people. And that is how it started. And so after she passed away, I really, you know, again, I wasn't in this business. I didn't know anything about dementia. I, nothing. And um, God really placed a seed in my heart. One day you're going to do something with dementia and dolls. And I was like, okay. And um, after I heard the word dementia, because I didn't even really know back then what it was. And so, you know, I started working in hospice and I would see little ladies in nursing homes and maybe one would have a baby doll that looks like my grandmother's, you know, it's really, really tiny. And I would ask, you know, where did she get that? Or did y'all give that to her? Or where did that come from? And no one ever knew. No one ever knew where the baby came from. <laughs> I was like, I guess it just like it came with her and, uh, but everybody would say, don't take it from her. And I was like, oh, don't worry, you know? And then as my career continued and I started spending more time in memory care areas and then memory care assisted living communities, I would see life stations. You know, the big thing used to be life stations. And we have a life station for, you know, if your mom was ever a gardener, she can do some planting. And we have a life station if dad was a carpenter, he can build something. And oh, and we have a crib and there's a baby in it in case mom loved children. And the thing that always struck me as strange was I saw these beautiful life stations and I knew that communities were spending a lot of money on putting this stuff together to make them look real. Very rarely would I ever see a resident engaged at one. And they had those in my mom's um, community. And then they, so my mom lived there for three years. So after the first 18 months, they renovated the entire community and they took a lot of those out. And they had, I'm pretty sure they had, I don't know if they had a crib or they had like a little nursery. That's like a little, or yeah, the vignette. Yeah. Um, yeah. They had a woodworking type vignette. Yeah. It was, it's, it's been a while, so it's a little hard to remember, but yeah. I don't, they had a baby doll, but it just kind of hung out with all the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I always was just 
a little confused by that and, and because no one ever really was doing anything with any of it. And so um, I decided that whenever, you know, I wanted to launch the program for a while and I so whenever I really got the bug was when um, my daughter was we were she was in high school preparing to go off to college. And so I thought, OK, that's going to be the perfect time because I'm, I only have one child and I'm going to have all this time on my hands and it'll be great. And so I did what any normal American person would do. I was like, I'm just going to jump online and find a dementia doll therapy class. I'm just going to take it. Well, there was nothing I could find nothing. I found a lot of memory care organizations that talked a little bit about doll therapy, but there was no meat and potatoes behind it. You know, it, it was just kind of mentioned here, there, and yonder. And so I started looking up research. Couldn't find any research in the U.S., barely anything. And finally, through just all of my digging and Googling and everything else, um, you know, I found that there's only been 15 research studies done worldwide on dementia doll therapy. That's crazy. And crazy. And there, there are a couple going on now up north. I'm in Texas, so they're going on up north. But um, the very first study was not even done until 2001, and that was done in Japan. And so the first study we ever had in dementia doll therapy in the U.S. was 2011. Hmm. So what's interesting about the studies that are out there are that the participants were in very small numbers also. There's actually a study on the books that was done in the U.S. and there was one woman, one participant. And and I thought, how is that a study? How are we comparing her to anybody? But uh, that's what I was just thinking. So I guess you know we counted, but there really was not a lot out there. There certainly wasn't a class to take. And so, you know, although the first study was really done in Japan, I think at least from my perspective, I consider the UK the birthplace of dementia doll therapy. I mean you know the uk australia they are miles ahead of us from a holistic perspective in the way that they approach medicine period you know they i find the us we're we're medicine first they're and they're medicine last and so we want to give everybody a pill we you know just let's just figure out the pill and then this all going to go away well there's a lot of people like me out there that that didn't work that that was not an option for our family and for my grandmother and so i learned after studying i found a great neurologist that <clears throat> was really at the front lines of dementia doll therapy and um studied along with his group virtually and sorry turn that off and um really learned that way i mean there was there was no one here to kind of teach me anything and so i would ask you know friends of mine that ran als and memory care you know what do you think about that and they would they would not have any answers for me and i worked in hospice so i obviously had lots of um i was around doctors a lot and i would ask doctors do you know anything about dementia doll therapy and they'd be like what is that <laughs> and no one do anything and um so after I really felt like I'd gotten some good information under my belt, I mean, I, I, I was always very drawn to dementia patients just because of my grandmother. So I'd already, you know, gotten my CDP. I'd done lots of dementia certifications and classes and all the things that you can do. And, you know, I felt like I was pretty with it as far as education and, you know, started really gaining an understanding of the reason why dementia doll therapy works and i thought okay the next thing i got to figure out is the dolls because we cannot have a doll like my nanny had like like the cheap tacky no, tacky plastic no, one <laughs> no and and the reason was you know as i learned more and more there, there are several reasons but one of the main things that used to drive me nuts is so, so my grandmother, like a lot of people with dementia, either lost or gave away her dentures. <laughs> Just one day they were gone. Knowing her, she gave them away. Yuck. And so, I know. So this, I always laugh and say, this is not a medical term, it's a Tanya term. She became very gummy. 
So, so she slobbered. And so everything went in her mouth, you know, and including her doll's hair. And so she would have her doll in its hair. Imagine it was just awful. And so, um, I was like, well, you know, I know enough now to know that that could never fly from a regulatory perspective in an assisted living or memory care. I also had to figure out, a, you know, getting a doll that was big enough that made an impact. You know, the the little ladies you even still see in the nursing home, they're scooting around with a doll. I mean, they literally have this tiny doll sitting on their lap and it's just little. It's so tiny. And so it took us ordering 56 different types of dolls in a year and a half to find our dolls. So I'm super proud of them. People are like, well, I can just go buy a doll on the internet. I'm like, well, you could, but let me tell you what you're going to get because I'd spent a year doing that. <laughs> um, and so at first, at, at, at first, I mean, I thought, you know, okay, now I've got it figured out. I, I know why the therapy works. I can talk to people about it never been afraid of, you know, approaching anyone with dementia or anything like that. I literally called up a friend of mine who sits on our board of directors today. And at the, at the time she ran an assisted living and I said, Hey, I've got these baby dolls and I want to bring them over. And, um, I'm bringing five and I'm just going to give them away. I just want to see what the reaction is. And she's okay. And so she called me a couple days later and she was like, okay, uh, just checking in on the, on letting you know how the babies are. And I'm like, yes, what's going on? And she said, we need 20 more. <laughs> Um, everyone wants a doll. And I was like, what? And so for probably our first year out of the gate, we, we raised money and we had baby showers and we would, we would talk to a, a community and we'd say, how many babies do you need? And they'd say, oh, we have 20 residents, but I think only 10 would like one. And I did learn there was there were there was one out of the 15 research studies that's made it very clear that 56% of the time staff guesses wrong on whether or not, some, you know, a loved one will incorporate the doll. And so I said, nope, we've got to we've got to bring enough for everybody. So that there's no arguing and dementia and, and peer pressure exists in dementia. OK, so if if Miss Lois don't have a baby today, she may want one tomorrow. And um, so we would just go around and give out babies. And then I figured out I would go back into the communities about two weeks after we had given out babies and I would just walk through the community and there were no babies anywhere. And I was like, where are all the babies? Like we had this big party, weren't y'all here? <laughs> I remember it's four kids, the balloons, it's a boy, it's a girl, you know? And uh, so what I would hear from the staff on the floor was, oh, it's not baby time. It's not on the activity calendar. We're not gonna do that till next week. We don't have time to pull them out. We don't have time for this. We don't have time for that. We're short staff, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, all right. So back to the UK I go, I'm like, I guess I forgot to ask, you know, where I got to train these people. And so from there, we started developing training. And um, I mean, my hard and fast rule now is no one gets a baby without training because the residents don't get the benefit of what the therapy can offer. Even if someone were to go onto our website and just order a baby, which you can do, the baby comes with an entire kit, an entire resource guide of how you introduce the baby, the types of clothes the baby wears, 30 different activities you can do with the baby. What, what happens if mom doesn't want the baby? Can you reintroduce it? How, reintroduce it? How do you go about that? You know, all of these different things. And so um, I started saying, okay, we've got to train caregivers. And when we started training caregivers, that is when things just busted open because caregivers were so and are so starved to learn something new and something that can save or buy them a little time on the floor. And so imagine that you are a caregiver or imagine you're at home taking care of your mom and you just want to go to the bathroom yeah. alone alone <laughs> it's like having a german shepherd you know this doesn't work you just want five minutes 
for a moment. And so having the dolls, knowing how to utilize the dolls with your loved one, giving them some different activities um, is a great way to buy time throughout your day. And so I tell caregivers, we've actually timed it. Um, someone with moderate dementia, um, it will take them up to 40 minutes to change a diaper on a doll. So imagine that you've got one of your residents that you're typically spending the most of your majority of your time chasing around. <laughs> And now you've got them settled and you started, you know, you've mirrored some actions for them and they are engaged and they're safe and they're satisfied. And you've just bought yourself a little bit of time to go over here and check on Miss Brenda because she's been isolating. And why hasn't she been out of her room all day? Because everywhere is short staffed, you know, mm -hmm. it's just it's just the way it is. No one's going to take care of mom like you're going to take care of mom. And so um, expectations are high, but our industry as a whole, just from a medical healthcare perspective is extremely short staffed. So when I talk to caregivers, I'm like, when you do this right, it can buy you some time. And then their faces really light up. They're like, oh, okay, now this, now this is making a little bit more sense. Well, that so, leads, that leads me to a quick question. Mm -hmm. Was your, how many kids did your grandmother have? Oh, she had five. Okay. Was she like, one of those ladies that's like baby crazy for lack of a yeah. better term. No. Okay. Cause my mom mm -hmm. wasn't either. I'm mm -hmm. the oldest of two, you know, my mom, she admired babies, other people's babies, mm -hmm. but she was glad she didn't have babies anymore. So I personally mm -hmm. would not have considered dementia mm -hmm. doll therapy for her just because it didn't make sense. But when we had our pre-chat, you also said that some men, oh yeah so yes. how do we yes. how do we figure yes. out how do we figure out who who's gonna benefit who's interested like who's not gonna just fling the doll in the corner and walk well, away it's you know it's very interesting because i i'm gonna i'll share an example i'm gonna answer your, your question but i'm gonna share an example first so last week we did a um <clears throat> we did a big event a baby shower event in a memory care community <clears throat> And we always invite the families. We do a lot of, um, you know, kind of pre-family education as well and make sure that families kind of understand what's going on. You know, I, I talk to communities. I'm like, the last thing you want is on a Saturday, a daughter to walk in here and see everybody has a doll and there's no one on the floor. And why, why is mom playing with a bunch of toys? I'm paying $8,000 for her to live here and y'all got dolls now, you know? So it, 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 it does need to be explained to families, right? It had to be explained to me. Or I, I mean, if I didn't believe it, I never would. If I didn't see it, I never would have believed it. So last week, I have a daughter who comes to a large baby shower event. Her mother's wheelchair bound. Her mother's 98. And the, the daughter's pushing her mom in the wheelchair. And she comes over to me and she says, I don't think this is a good idea for my mom. And I said, okay. And I said, may I ask why? And she's... And, and I think at first I said, do you mean the party or do you mean the baby is because it's always a very lively, you know, surrounding. And she said, just all of it. And I said, OK. And uh, she said we had a lot. She had um, many miscarriages mm. as she was young. Um, I've lost siblings and there's just a lot of trauma in our family related to babies. And I don't think she's going to handle this well. And I said, I totally understand. And I said, don't worry, no one is going to force your mother to hold a baby. I promise yeah, That's you. a pretty fair point. Yeah. And she, I could tell the daughter was really anxious. And I said, I'll tell you what, um, do you mind if I interact with your mom for a little bit? And I was not even holding the baby. And she said, well, she doesn't speak. I said, that's fine. I understand. And I told her the story about my grandmother. I said, you know, I thought it would be crazy. And I said, listen, the goal the goal is not to get everybody to love dementia doll therapy and everybody have a, have a baby doll and all of that. The goal is to create meaningful moments of purpose. And that, that might be for five minutes today, five hours or five seconds, you know, I don't know. Um, and I, so I just knelt down by her mother and I just, you know, started trying to communicate with her talking about her, she had a beautiful crocheted little hat on and she was trying mumbling back to me. So, 
um, I said, do you, I would like to try and just present her with a baby and see how it goes. She's not going to have to do anything with the baby. I will hold it. Okay. Man, but the daughter was really anxious. And so I go <laughs> and I get a baby and I bring it over and we have developed a very, very specific technique that we use when we are introducing a baby to an individual with dementia. And so I just knelt down beside her and I was holding the baby and I was just watching her body language and I'm talking to her and she's kind of trying to talk back, but of course I can't understand what she's saying. And the daughter is like, you know, hovering <laughs> to the point to where I said, I think you're making her nervous because you're kind of making me nervous. And I was like, just give me a second. I'm not, mom's going to be fine. And um, so I could tell the little lady kept looking at the doll. And so that's my cue, right? And so I just gently raised the doll and I leaned forward and she leaned forward to me and I asked, what do you think about this? And so we never say, do you want to hold the baby? Look at our baby, look at our doll. Listen, dementia does not take away the ability for a for someone to make a decision. And if you've ever worked with anyone with dementia, even at the end of their life, if they don't want something, you're going to know it. Mm -hmm. And so if I can read body language and I know that they don't want the baby, um, I offer the next best thing. And we're at a baby shower. So the next be best thing is a cookie or a cupcake. And that solves all the world's problems. Yep. <laughs> so she was just very, very focused on the baby. And I just leaned forward and I said, what do you think about this? And I got a little bit of a smile. And, and, and I, by this time I had asked the daughter just to step back just a little bit. And um, I just kind of leaned forward and she leaned forward with me. And I said, do you want it? And she said, yes. And so I placed it in her arms. We always handle the babies just like they're real infants and a tear started coming. coming out. Oh God, the, the daughter is going to beat me up at the parking lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so the daughter is very close by and says, see, see, this isn't good. This isn't good. And I said, just hold on. I said, please just hold on and let me be in this moment with her. It is a very one-on-one -on -one interaction. Let me just stay in the moment with her. She said, okay. And so she started touching the baby and I start pointing out things on the baby and, and she's starting to hold it tighter and tighter and they're real squishy and, and she's looking at its eyes and it's, she's already, you're trying to, trying to take its hat off and it's little bow off. And, um, she just starts looking around, you know, you can just tell it's just, there's something different about her. And her daughter was like, I haven't seen her this alert in two years. And I said, okay. And so I let the daughter come sit back down. And I said, can I ask the daughter, can I get you some punch? Cause yeah. like, some I, need spiked punch. <laughs> I need a break from you. But, um, so I said, she's fine. And I, I just told the little lady, I said, I'm going to walk away and get some punch and I'm going to come back. Do you want me to take her, meaning the baby? Clear as day. The lady said, she's best where she is. Clear as that? Clear as bell. Holy moly. Well, I was like, am I, like I, no, I see this all the time, but sometimes I'm even taken aback. And I, I looked at the daughter because I think the daughter probably thinks I've done some voodoo stuff to her mom. <laughs> and I looked at the daughter and the daughter's eyes were huge. And she said, Mama, Mama, did, what did you say? And she looked at the daughter and then she looked back at me and she said, it's best you leave her here. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. Okay. No one's going to bother her. And so I went on about my business, helping other people. And then it was time to go back to her room. And it was time for everyone to like eat their dinner. I think it was dinner. And so the staff has already been trained on if you ever take a baby from someone, you have to tell them where it's going and you have to tell them you're bringing it back. Because in my mind, if you take my newborn out of my hands and you just leave with it, <laughs> 
I mean, that is what a lot of our residents think. And so um, I told, I went and told everybody, do not take her baby. Just, just let her be, let her be with her baby. And so we go on about our business and the daughter comes up to me and she was like, I, I don't know what to say. And I said, you don't have to say anything. And I said, I see this all the time. And I said, well, you were thinking it's tears of sadness. It was tears of joy because she was starting to clutch that baby so tight. And the way that our babies are, the, the longer and, and tighter you squeeze them, the warmer they get. And so, and they also smell like newborn babies. And so it's all about sensory. Everything is detailed on the dolls. And so I said, you were very concerned as you should be as normal that it was going to be a traumatic experience when for her now this is your way of bridging the gap so she said you know i don't need, I, i've just lost all communication with my mom like i don't even know what to say to her when i come and visit her and i said well now you don't say anything now you keep a package of newborn diapers in your car and you bring one in every time you come or you bring a newborn baby outfit because they wear real baby clothes and everything's about the baby and that's how you bridge that gap and you know your mom is in a different place than you are and you're never gonna get that back. So you've gotta figure out an innovative way to get into her bubble and her circle. And this is this might be it. And she was like, I just don't know what to say. I mean, and so anyway, to answer your question, um, we absolutely, the technique that we use, that we've been trained and taught from the United Kingdom is we, everything that we do in presenting a baby put the resident or the loved one in total control of the decision so we don't just hand somebody babies and say oh my gosh it's so cute let me take a picture no you know knowing that it takes someone with dementia almost 90 seconds to process a simple instruction you've got to be very slow you've got to talk loud but slow and calm and it's a very very one-on-one -on -one interaction um and if they don't want it they just simply say, if I, if their eyes never leave my face or my volunteer's face and go to the baby, they're not interested and that's okay. And so I train people stay in the moment with them because if they say no, or if they don't want to participate, that may be the only decision they get to make for themselves that day. And yep. that is as therapeutic as the little lady that's holding the baby that doesn't want to give it up in their mind, they have control in that moment because they've lost all control of everything. Everybody makes all their decisions for them. They have no control over anything. And so, um, you know, the saying no can be just as powerful as someone embracing it. And, you know, I tell caregivers, don't be afraid if they say no, it's okay. And you can always come back and try again in a week or two. And so, um, you know, we've, we've been asked everything, you know, wh what if um, someone never had children, would, would, would they like a baby? I'm like, it's like babies and puppies. Everybody loves them. <laughs> now, they may only want them for a couple hours and give them back to you, but they'll, they'll engage. Um, men immediately go into grandpa play mode. Trotty horse, patty cake. They want to sing, they want to hum, they want to play where women want to hug, kiss, nurture, men are ready to play. Um, retired engineers and lawyers are within moments of you handing them that baby. They're trying to figure out a way to get it glued or duct taped or attached to the walker so they can keep it. <laughs> we just duct -taped. love it. We just love it. it, I, it I just love it. And um, you know there's there's a uh, the latest video or one video i just posted on my facebook page was a, a very recent event where um i was told by the caregivers at this particular community that one of the gentlemen was extremely aggressive and i always ask on delivery day look point out to me who's super aggressive who you don't think wants a baby who never participates let me take that person so that the caregivers can go experience some success in the program early on. And so I'll take that person and they don't know me. And so sometimes it's easier on, on the receiver. And um, he was in a wheelchair and they were like, don't kneel down, he's gonna kick you. He'll kick you right in the chest. And I was like, well, I mean, this is kind of what we do, you know? And I just said a little prayer and I just started talking to him and he spoke Spanish, I don't. So we had a language barrier, plus it was, it was word salad. 
So I don't know what we talked about, but um, we talked for a while and um, he kept staring and he finally said, baby. And I said, oh, this baby? And he immediately reached for it and he wanted that baby. And so they were, the caregivers were just standing around and they were like, okay, first of all, I can't believe he didn't hit you. Second of all, I cannot believe he's participating. And so I just say, you know, listen, you've got to take your time. You've, it's got to be one-on-one. -on -one. It has to be in the moment. I've had ladies who have lost children in very tragic ways, want twins. They name them after their kids they've lost. I, you know, women who've never had children, um, men who have never been married or had children. It, it, what we remember of them is not where they are. True. And so that's often, it's very hard. I tell family members all the time, look, this disease is way harder on you as a family member than it is on them. We're catering to their every need. We're trying to make sure they're safe, fed, secure, comfortable, dry, you know, <laughs> we're dressed. Happy. We're, we're trying to cater to all of this. And, and for the family, the family is stuck in, but dad would never have played with a dog. No, and see, I can picture not. when I think about my dad, mm -hmm. he was the typical, you know, dad of the 70s and 80s. I was born in the end of 66. So that era, um, he worked, my mom stayed home with us, very traditional family, right? And so I'm, I'm thinking, oh, my dad would like, pff, never. I mean, I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't think my mom would be that interested because she was never that interested in babies. But when you talk about the grandpa part, I'm like, well, duh, now I feel stupid because <laughs> my dad adored my daughter, did silly things with her. I'm like, duh, like, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe he was kind of a little harsh as a parent, but sure. he was awesome as a grandfather, way better as a grandfather than he was as a dad. Let's just well, say that. I think all, all five of my grandmother's children would say the same thing about her that that she was um look it was it was v during a very difficult time um people worked really hard had to have five mouths to feed look that wouldn't be fun today much less you know back back then and um it was a matter of getting through the day and feeding your kids you know i mean literally and you know they certainly weren't um from wealth uh but as a grandmother it was a totally different story. And so, and that's why I, we call it the grandbaby project because she, I mean, you know, she was the type of grandmother that was like, drop them off and I'll call you when to come back and get them. Well, do you want us to come for Christmas? No, I got the grandkids. I don't need y'all. You know, I mean, she, <laughs> she, was like with the, <laughs> she didn't want any of her kids. She was like, she could just bring me the grandbabies. And so, um, you know, I don't know if it's, sometimes I think it's that, but, but the majority of the time, um, people will name their babies after their own children. And so I don't know if they revert back to this is my baby or this was my grandchild or, you know, there's an, there's as humans, we have, we have the need for attachment and we're born with that. And I don't think that that ever, ever goes away. And, and we see it, we see it day in and day out. So it, we, so we have, I had a physician who was asking me some questions. I don't know if I shared this with you. I probably did. Cause I think it's hysterical. Doctors love to think they know everything. And, um, you know, most of the time we just let them think they do. And, um, he said, now tell me about this doll thing and you know, how's this thing work? And so I'm telling him and he said, well, I, I just, I, I would need to see it to believe it. And then I would need to see the research. And I said, okay. I said, well, there's been 15 research studies done worldwide. Um, I think all 15 contain less than 400 participants. And so we've delivered over 2,500 dementia therapy dolls and we've trained over 1,500 caregivers. So what questions do you have? Because we've done more than all the research combined worldwide. <laughs> so if, if there's something like that you're wanting to know i've probably seen it 
and and so he actually started coming like to he came to one of our showers and he he comes to him whenever whatever building he has we're having a shower he's there and he's like it just blows my mind it's amazing and i said imagine being in the uk because they could write a script for this Mm. we would never do that here we'll do it for um, um special needs children for play therapy, which is, I think is great. I think is very important, but when it comes to the way we care for our elderly and the way that we um, approach medicine in the elderly, you know, it's that, that would probably never happen. So um, I, you know, the other thing I compare it to is, you know, I'm such a believer because I saw it firsthand, literally. And um, the, the research backs up everything I saw less isolating less outbursts less depression improved appetite less use of medications less wandering less sundowning more socialization easier to groom and so um and just that attachment and that that need for purpose day in and day out i'm gonna wake up and take care of this baby i mean i remember having an infant i gotta wake up and take care of this baby that was like your whole thought and then you know i just want to say one more thing It'll probably be more than one thing, but before I forget, forget, people will often ask me, what if they think it's a doll? Does that ever happen? I'm like, oh, it happens all the time. And I said, so when I was a little girl, I loved dolls. I mean, when my daughter was little, I loved buying her dolls. So I grew up during a time where mom would take me you want a new doll you get a new doll you go to toys r us and there's rows and rows and aisles and aisles of dolls and you got to pick that doesn't exist anymore no nope. because if you go to target it's everything is you know disney related or batman spider woman whatever so kids don't get that experience anymore everything's on amazon you gotta buy it on amazon you know you don't get to pick out your doll anymore and so as a little girl, I knew that that was a baby doll. I knew it wasn't real, but I wanted it. And I wanted to take care of it. And so that's what we see a lot. If someone says, that's not a baby, that's a doll. I'll say, you think, okay, well, okay. I just, it's fine. You think it's a doll? Would you like to, you want to hold the doll? And that's why in our introduction, we specifically wait for them to decide what they think it is, because I don't want to say doll or I don't want to say baby. They think doll. I mean, are, anybody that's ever tried to argue with someone with dementia, you're never going to win. <laughs> that's a losing battle. <laughs> a losing battle. And I don't know why it takes us so long to figure that out. But um, but the it's interesting because the, the women who think they are dolls or even the men who think they are dolls, they want one everybody else in the room's got one and then oh we're going to take them outside and we're going to get to do take the babies out okay well i'm taking let me get my baby you know and so it's i i just let the resident lead the conversation 100 percent. 100 percent. well the, the approach is very interesting because i would have done it all wrong if i had even considered doing this with my mom i would have done it <laughs> yeah. all wrong <laughs> it would have been a total failure because I would yeah, have done it yeah. wrong. We get, we get real antsy whenever um, I uh, when, when we're doing a, a presentation at a at an event, and so I will make an announcement literally before the event begins to to the employees. If you have not been trained specifically by me or my team, you do not present dolls today. You do not present babies because you do not know what you're doing and that's fine you're gonna learn today but you are not allowed to hand someone a doll because inevitably what will happen is they will grab the doll isn't it cute isn't it cute shove it in the arms of the person typically sitting in a wheelchair and they're like like what the heck and then they're looking like you can see their poor little confusion. Is this a baby? Is somebody made a baby or is this a dog? I mean, that's an overwhelming responsibility, you know? And so we don't, yeah, I'm, I'm a real stickler about it. And so even when, when people just order from us, um, I make sure that they have instructions and they have a video from me on introduction. They have my phone number, you know, um, I think it's really important that we not forget that just because someone has dementia, they absolutely can make 
a decision on what they want and that can't be overlooked. And when that's overlooked, it's not therapeutic, it's just control. And so that's why we have a very specific way of putting them in control to take or not take a baby. That's mm-hmm. just amazing. And I've just, I, well, do you have videos of men interacting with the dolls on Facebook? Okay, I'm gonna have to check oh, those yeah. out. They're so good. They're so good. They're great. Yeah. There was a resident in my mom's community who was a very tall man. Um, he used to be like one of those ultra marathoners, which like, ew. And <laughs> um, he got super agitated because he couldn't get a hold of his wife because she was in the Santa Cruz mountains with Bible camp. Hmm. And so when you were talking about the aggressive residents, I thought about him because mm-hmm. I'm thinking, you know, they were obviously um, they, they spent a lot of time with kids. I'm wondering if that would have helped him because yeah. he he needed something because, you know, like you couldn't he still had the physical capabilities of going and running, but you couldn't let him go run. And oh, yeah, yeah, it was just it was a disaster. So that's that's the kind of stuff that I like to share because everybody was at their wits end about what to do with this guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, you know, we always make sure that after training and and all of that, that we leave um, either a family or the community um, with resources and a list of about 40 different activities that can be done either one-on-one with the baby or in group settings. And so, you know, I do this whole talk on, okay, so tell me about someone who starts sundowning. What time is it? And the staff will start telling me in training. I'm like, okay, who wants to pretend to be that person? Because I'm gonna role play what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do this with the baby. So, you want to be Miss Johnson and she starts sundowning. I want you to assume her personality 100%. Don't hold back. And everybody's like, oh my gosh. And then I said, I'm going to be a caretaker, a caregiver, and I'm going to have a baby. And let me show you what I would do if I were here with you tonight when that started. Okay. Knowing what I know about doll therapy. And, um, we start pacing, we start pacing, we start looking at doors, we start looking at windows and we start pacing. And I'm like, we just take the baby, we're holding the baby. We never say a word about the baby. We're just taking the baby and we're matching her step for step. And we're just talking to her and we're talking slow and we're just trying to be calm and we're trying to get her to start just matching our pace. And this is gonna take a while. This is why it's so hard for these play our our communities to be understaffed because this takes so much time Mm -hmm. Uh, and everybody would just rather you know give them a dose of whatever to make them calm down um but you just you just match her step for step and you just stay with her and you just stay in that moment and then you start saying things like oh she is heavy and then you'll start getting her glancing over like and then she'll ignore you and you'll be like, oh, can we slow down? She's getting upset. Can we, can we just slow down for a minute? You're just kind of patting the baby's bottom or, you know, you're like, oh, she is getting upset. I think, I think she may have a wet diaper. Can you help me? Will you just help me just for a minute? And then, and then we're going to, we're going to go back to walking. Okay. Yeah. Come over here. Let's just, and, and now you're, you're trying to get that resident to help you to sit down it's going to take a long minute to undress this baby and all of our dolls are delivered on purpose in multiple layers for that reason. And so keep it good. Yeah. So even though we hand select every piece of clothing that the dolls wear to ensure a proper and positive sensory and texture experience. So corduroy is very popular, tutus, everybody wants a baby with a tutu, they love those. Um, Soft cottons, velvets, fleece. Um, A lady asked me the other day, she was volunteering dressing babies and she said, why are we putting them all in sweaters and it's summer? I said, well, first (laughs) of all, they don't know that it's summer. And second of all, let's talk about that. And you know, anything that's knitted or anything, you know, they just love to touch and touch, which means they're gonna hold that baby longer. And so I said, you know, you're going to take the time with the sundowner and then that's going to let your partners try to get everybody else, uh, you know, make sure everybody else is kind of situated, but at least you have a new tool. And if you pass the bassinet on one of the rounds, you just 
grab another baby because now you have two and now you really need help. And so it's always from the perspective of, can you help me? Would you like to help me? I really could use your help. I need your help. And um, if you stay with it long enough, you can you can kind of break that cycle. You know, I tell everyone when I get these looks like doll therapy, the first thing that I used to be really you know touchy about it, like, well, yes, it's fabulous. But now I'm like, <laughs> now I, I'm I'm just like, why does everybody get excited when the golden retriever comes in for pet therapy? Because golden retrievers are awesome. We all know the golden retrievers are awesome and they're so sweet and they're so loving and they're so beautiful and handsome and it's different and it's out of the norm and the residents love it and the families love it and they're soft and it meets an emotional attachment need in that moment. It is a tool. They're not going to raise the golden retriever. One, one resident with my mom, she tried to keep mine. She decided oh, he was, yeah, she decided he was hers. He had the pinch collar on that did not make her happy. She told me to take it off. And I was like, this little guy is a runner. I had a small rescue golden. I've had six. I have one right oh now God. sleeping <laughs> on the couch over here. And my fear was that he would get excited and just like bolt and run. Cause yeah. if he got like, he was like a horse, they get the tape, you know, like the scent of the barn and he was gone yeah he was like that the the front door was open just open enough long enough that he could blast past you he would run on the golf course we lived on until he was exhausted and literally had to drag his exhausted body home and i mean you could you either had to go out there with a net like a cartoon yeah. i've seen him like just lay out like i'm done i'm just i'm not yeah. moving <laughs> Once he jumped over the fence, drank out of the fountain, and you could see he was wobbly. He was so tired. And he saw me looking at him, and he was like, uh-uh, no. jump back over the fence, and away he went. And I was like, okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've had some experience with pet therapy wow. in memory wow. care, and that went really well. Although my oldest, Golden, absolutely hated it. Wow. Um, I don't. He loved me more than anything else, including himself. So. Yeah. I think he probably picked up on my anxiety, but it was just very strange. And, but no, the youngest one I had at the time, just, we saw everybody. And then we went over to the assisted living and saw lots of people over there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, mm -hmm. it, I don't know why I would have thought doll therapy wouldn't have worked with my mom, dog therapy, <laughs> but my mom loved dogs. <laughs> that, that was her repetitive story. I've had dogs all my life. Da, 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 da. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'm sure my, yeah. I'm sure most of my listeners can repeat the story now because I've told it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could probably go on a whole other hour just talking about yeah. stories about dogs and yeah. dolls and where. Yeah. So the website is what the uh, grandbabyproject.com. So, no, it's so so we're a nonprofit. So it's um, the grandbabyproject.org. Okay, which is hot linked in the show notes. Yeah. And uh, you can reach us on Facebook. Facebook's oh, I. Facebook's so easy to update. So. Our website's great, but you're going to see the funnest, best stuff on Facebook because it's like from yesterday, you know, and the showers and the videos and all that kind of stuff. So I always like to send people to Facebook first. And, um, you know, if anybody um, has questions, I'm super easy to get to. You can you can message me through the website. All that comes straight to me. You can message me on Facebook. All that comes through me or my uh, virtual assistant. Um, anybody have any questions or anything like that? You know, one thing that we are seeing across the country it, that's really caused us to step out and, and start looking at how we're going to expand differently is that activity professionals really need training and they want training on dementia doll therapy they want to learn more about it they want to know more about it um, Healthcare companies that are doing private duty sitting or home health services we work with those types of companies um, that get dolls at discounted rates we train them on how to you know take them out for visits and all kinds of things so there are a million ways to get confused uh, to get confused to volunteer and get confused <laughs> Um, you know, we're always looking, we, so everybody always asks me, what is your biggest need? And I'm like, the biggest need, number one is babies, of course, because we'll do over 3,500 just this year and at diapers. So we mm. always have a on wish list up on our Facebook page and it just asks for diapers and wipes and that's really it. <laughs> so they don't need formula. Yeah. 
I say that, and I, you know, it's so funny because I'll tell a little resident, you know, the best thing about this baby is it doesn't cry and it does not grow up to be a teenager. And they just laugh. <laughs> they think that's great, you know. So anyway, but thank you for letting us chat about it. You know, our vision and mission is to put a dementia therapy doll in the arms of anyone who needs one, regardless of um, price. I never, ever, ever want someone to think that they're too expensive. They can't get one. And so um, I, I encourage people reach out to me directly and um, we will do it. We are always raising money for people who want the service and the training, but may or may not have the means to get it. So we're, we're totally here to help hundred percent. Well, that's an awesome goal. And I'll make sure the Facebook page is also linked in the show notes okay. so everybody can just pop over there and check out all the fun videos of one of these days you'll have to do golden retrievers and babies and just we will we will my friend has a has a golden and she and uh, she does pet therapy and I told her we need to get a saddle. <laughs> <laughs> and we need a baby. I said, oh my gosh, that would be great. We could kill two birds with one stone. How funny would that be? We should put a little saddle on the golden and put a baby in it. It'd be awesome. So anyway. Okay, my golden would reject that, but my golden is super social. So she she will help she you out. Star. Yeah. Oh, she's, yeah. She goes for a walk in the morning and she really kind of needs a second socialization in the afternoon. It's actually a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. part of it's because she was always either part of a trio or a duo for the majority oh. of her life. And now she's a solo dog. Now she's solo. Yeah. Well, so, partner. yeah. So we, <laughs> that's my, that's my caregiving is the uh, 75 pound golden retriever that runs my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if it makes any difference. I have a five pound long haired chihuahua that runs mine and they sound very similar and uh, <laughs> talk about drama. Yeah. Very dramatic, very dramatic. But anyway, yeah, so. chihuahuas are dramatic. Well, this has been fantastic. I Thank hope you guys you. all check out the website and the Facebook page. Ah. And I hope this has helped you understand how this all works. Mm -hmm. I know it's taught me a lot of things. So that's got to be a good thing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, everyone. Reach out if you need help. I'm here to help. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.